welcome to a special edition of the SBK Betting Podcast, where we'll be previewing the Qatar Goodwood Festival, or or better known as the Glorious Goodwood Festival. Um, five wonderful days of action at the stunning location uh, in, in the West Sussex track. Goodwood, so well known for getting some brilliant jewels. The Sussex States will take centre stage. We'll see, we'll see the best horse in the world in Baid, and there'll be plenty of other uh, huge names, including Stradivarius, who will see his career come to an end. Uh, we hope, um, as as things stand in the Goodwood Cup. So we've got plenty to look forward to. Um, as always, we have Ross Miller joining us and uh, we have Luke Elder, who is in for us as Tom Collins continues his paternity leave. And we hope, um, if you're listening to this after the weekend, that Luke has given you all the winners to, to roll him into Goodwood in a good way. Luke, first of all, Goodwood, is this a festival that you really like getting your teeth into or is it come at a point where things just get... So confusing. Who do we know if something's well handicapped or not anymore? Who's the best in Britain when it comes to X or Y? Where do you stand with Goodwood? Your first thing says, how good was I at the weekend putting up all those winners? <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. Uh, <laughs> no, Goodwood, it, it's, it's frustrating, but it's so enjoyable, isn't it? You, you, you kind of you kind of get a feel for things on day one about about what you're going to expect. You're always going to have one day where you get an absolute deluge. That That's just the rule of, of Glorious Goodwood. There has to be one of the wettest days of the calendar year during that week. Uh, gener- my money would be on Thursday. Generally, it's more of a Thursday, but we'll, we'll see that further down the line. It's just, it's a nice mix of casual racing of a few maidens, a few nurseries, and then the real top class stuff that we're going to get into in in this podcast, the group ones, group twos. And obviously you've got the Stewards Cup, the the, the, consul, uh, the consolation at the end of the week as, as well to uh, to look forward to. So part in part, there's there's plenty of notebook races, but there's also plenty of punting races as well, which uh, we're we're going to quite enjoy on this, um, this podcast. Yeah, yeah, you're so right. There's always a, a Charlie and Mark Johnson good thing that they've got laid out for it. And there's also can be quite a few horror stories as well um, at Goodwood. But yes, as you say, we'll get straight into it. We're going to start uh, with the Lennox Stakes, um, which will take place on the Tuesday, so the opening day, seven furlongs. And as a group two, seven furlongs, it's, it's actually a great opportunity for a lot of horses that just don't really get many there's just not many races like this around enough of them especially for three-year-olds and older and sacred is that kind of horse who um is is, this is her optimum trip and i believe this probably her optimum track as well she was last seen racing over the six furlongs in the platinum uh, jubilee um but there are it's always been a good feel to this race but i just think there could be some can be a few shocks that can come out of it. We saw Sir Dance a lot win it a couple of times. We've seen big shocks. I remember Breston Rock winning it at a huge price for Dave Simcox. So it can throw up a few surprises. Um, Ross, is this a race that you uh, take a huge enthusiasm in? It can be a bit of a tricky puzzle to solve. It can, but on on first thought, I thought currently nine to four about Sacred. I thought that was a a decent price, really, because she she is definitely a seven furlong horse. I mean, it was a huge run in the Jubilee, staying on really well late in the day after 10 months off the track over six furlongs. Um, I thought that was a massive run. You might be a bit concerned that she could just bounce, but I think she had enough time between races. Wouldn't necessarily worry me. Just think quick ground, good wood. It's just made for her, isn't it? And I and I thought there was plenty in there against her. Pogo, for example, I think it's, it probably wants the top end of seven furlongs into a mile. I'm just not sure this track suits suits as well um so i was really keen on sacred the one that i just thought was at the moment a bit of a price if i can say this right is lane lane cash uh, around about eight to one um was a decent second behind uh sacred uh last year beaten a length at newbury um but then more recently was beaten a very short head in the john o'gaunt stakes um uh, by pogo and yet pogo is around four to one nine to two and, and, and Lancash is, is is eight to one. I thought that was far too big a price. I, I don't see there being that much between them for all that I think they're going to struggle to beat to beat Sacred. I think I think she is, as we say, there can be some upsets in it. I think as long as she doesn't bounce, I think she's going to take a huge amount of beating in this. And I expect it to be far closer to even money on the on the day. Yeah, she's uh, she's been compared by her trainer to to one master, but just 
slightly different in that she needs this ground as well. So she'll be happy that they'll be opening, I'd imagine, on good to firm ground, but they probably want a little bit more juice into it, um, especially if they want True Shan to appear in the in the good Goodwood Cup. But yeah, Sacred will have her optimum conditions. Are you with her against her, Luke? I, I respect Sacred. Um, I think you're very right in what you said about this race and how important it is to the the, the UK racing calendar. Obviously, at the end of the year, you've got the the seven furlong Group Ones, uh, the likes of the Foray being the, uh, the the main one, and, and a few others as well. You go over to America to try and stretch out to a mile. But throughout the course of the the calendar season, you've got some some Group Twos, the likes of the Hungerford over in Ireland. We've just had the Minstrel Stakes as as well, and then you've got this. This is kind of seen as the the best of those, but. I thought Sacred ran well last time around. I think seven furlongs is 100% her trip. I'm not massively convinced, I must say, about the Platinum Jubilee form, but she is a horse that I like, and I'm going the opposite way of Ross. I respect Sacred, but I like Lanakash. I was convinced as a two-year-old that Lanakash was a very, very good horse, and he was until he got to Newbury, and then he just got completely stuck in the mud. It was it was absolutely horrible conditions that day. He was sent off seven to four for the the Horace Hill, and he just got stuck and finished last of the, the 12. It took a little while to, to kind of recover from uh, from that. We, we didn't see him till the August uh, afterwards, and he, he kind of picked up in, in okay form, but his last few efforts have been getting better and better. It, rule out that the new market run two starts ago, that was a, a disaster. But last time around, he came from last to first at uh, Chester to take out the city plate. That was a very good effort. It, it, as long as the Tuesday isn't the rain day, I think Lanakash is going to go very, very close. And, and the faster the ground, the um, the better. So I agree with Ross, but at the same time, I'm also going the entire opposite way. Okay, yeah, Lanakash um, is a real interesting sort and he's been campaigned quite well, I, I, I feel, by, by Roger Varian, um, who I'm assume will have his horses in prime condition for for Goodwood. Um, yeah, it's just looking through that form of the, the Newbury win of um, Sacred. You know, she had some decent horses, Dream Loper behind her, Al Sahel, Tactical. I just, it's, yeah, it's, there's a lot of substance to that win. Um, and it, it, she is difficult to oppose. But I'm going to put up Liz Sale, who as a three-year-old gets the weight as well, especially from Sacred 2. And I just think he's been slightly overlooked. I put him up for the Prince of Wales, uh, Prince of Wales, sorry, the St. James Palace Stakes, where he was second at double figure prices. I think it was 25 to one or so. And um, he's got an interest. They, they led with him that day, but that really suited him. And we're going around a bend and that would be exactly the type of setup at Goodwood, obviously. At Dover last time, probably the track wasn't exactly in his favour, the straight course, but he still ran a really good race to be third behind Tenebrism. He's a really likeable, hardy sort, got that real May mass in him. Um, and I think that he could be a big player in this race. And uh, But having said that, Sacred is a hugely respected um, in the, for, the, for the Lennox Stakes. Um, okay, we'll, we'll, quick, we'll gather, up, gather on and move on to uh, the next race that we'll be looking at, which is the Goodwood Cup. We believe, I'd imagine, unlikely to, to feature True Shan, although you'd imagine they are desperate to run him. He's the kind of horse that they clearly campaigned with this in mind. They ran him in the in the Northumberland Plate because they needed a, a prep run. That all went to, to plan. Ross, do you feel like they could just do it anyway? Do you think there's do you think there's any reason to believe that they could just just go for it, or do that we need to have good ground? They they, they seem absolutely hell bent on just not running on anything quicker than good, don't they? Um, and, and you have to respect that. I know people jump up and down and say it's flat race and we want good to firm. And that's why I agree with that. I don't like this watering for good ground. It is flat racing. Primarily they're bred for good to firm. But if you've got someone as experienced as Alan King, and we can all sit here, they know the horse is better. There is clearly something about that horse's action or how he has come out of races where the ground is on the firmer side that makes him uncomfortable and makes him feel like he's rolling the dice in a game that he doesn't want to play so we can all get grumpy about it he's not doing it because he doesn't want to run he's doing it because he wants to keep the horse in in one piece so yeah i think it, if they were going to do it they surely would have done it on the last day at ascot when the, the rain was looking like it was coming I, I i can't think um the twists and turns on firm ground at, at goodwood is is going to be where they're going to roll the dice so i think no he's unlikely to run 
And he'll probably go down the same route as he did uh, last year. And there's plenty of targets for him abroad. The Prix de Catarine, you imagine he'll try and uh, defend his crown there. OK, so no true sham, we'd imagine. Kip Rios, uh, the Gold Cup winner, very much likely to take part. As we said, Stradivarius with this big old exciting news story that Andrea Zaini will ride, not Frankie de Tori, uh, for his final final run. Looks like the up-and-coming exciting stair Coltrane will be in it as well. Princess Zoe, will she, won't she? She's in this lineup. That's probably the main names, isn't it, Luke, that we've got to look forward to. Kiprios has obviously got everything going for him. What did you make of his Gold Cup victory? Do you think he can keep on this... Uh, unbeaten run that he's he's on this season yeah it's always exciting isn't it when you find a young top class stayer Kiprios is exactly that uh he, he managed to obviously beat Stradivarius last time around for what it's worth I think Frankie's been poor on Stradivarius for a while now um I think he's given him two or three bad rides and, and cost him a, a few races including the last two gold cups incidentally um whether this race out and out is going to suit him, I'm not overly sure. I think the longer straight will suit him absolutely down to the ground. We know that Goodwood's no issue, but the further out they get racing, the better it is for Stradivarius. Uh, is Kiprios a, a real out and out two and a half for Milo, i.e. Escort Gold Cup? Probably not 100%, but two miles, he's very, very good. He, he's not short on speed for a horse at, at this sort of, of trip. Aidan O'Brien, we know how good he is with his stayers uh, with, with horses over the years. And it, it's just hard to see an eight-year-old Stradivarius, as much as I'd love to see it, be a, an up-and-coming four-year-old in Kiprios. It's hard to see Trushan being there. Um, my grievance with Trushan, give him a go on good to firm. Just, I mean, he's six years old now. Or... Just suck it up and win the next four stairs hurdles with him. G- give us what we want in, in one way or, or another. The latter, and I, I'm aware Luke, the latter. Is a, I'm aware this is a glorious if, podcast and I managed to mention Cheltenham. Can I ask Apologies. a question? Do you think if they're worried about good to firm ground, surely they must be really worried about jumping him? That, you know, there's, it's much, well, it's much and much, and surely you've got as much risk involved in one or the other. Uh, potentially, but... We've never seen him on good to firm ground. So they've, they've got it in their heads. And I respect Alan King and the yard massively. But they've clearly got it in their heads that Trushan hates good to firm ground. I don't know if he does. We've never seen it. He's run on good to firm ground. Nottingham at the start of the year, I don't think it was good to soft. It was faster than that. He handled that. I know it was in a, a much, much lesser race. He handled the Tapita surface, which is far from racing on a soft surface at Newcastle last time around. Mm. Give him a go. Or just win the next four stairs hurdles. Either way, I'm I'm pretty happy. Uh, he won't be winning the next one. Anyway, we'll uh, we, we'll we'll keep this conversation going because I think we'll the, the sadness is that we were never going to see true Shan Stradivarius, and that's the real real sort of letdown, I suppose, because we'd love to see them battle it out. But would is I get the opinion from you there, Luke, that Kiprios would beat them both anyway. Yeah, I think so. I think Kiprios is just the best of them. Um, I, I kind of think that the main danger is Coltrane, who who looks a real up and coming individual. He, he was brilliant at Royal Ascot. He was very good, albeit in a race that did suit him at Sandown uh, last time around. I know it's come from a little way back, but Rob Hornby gave him a very good ride um, in the in the marathon. But there's just something about, a, as I say, an up and coming stayer. He's five. He's a year older than, than Kiprios, but. He, he's done things the harder way, per se. I, he's come through a handicap company. He was a little bit unlucky. I know um, our, our colleague Tom Collins really fancied him in the uh, in the, the Chester Cup when he was a, a rather unfortunate second behind uh, behind Cleveland. That form is very, very strong. I just think he's got a really nice make of a, of a stayer, and he could well be the main danger to Kiprios. I hope I'm entirely wrong and Stradivarius goes out on a high, but... From a betting point of view, with with actually putting real life money down, I'd be taking Kiprios to, to win and probably Coltrane to follow him home. Okay, yeah, I can't disagree with you with Coltrane. I think he's really exciting, a very interesting prospect. Um, Ross, where do you sit with it with this, and do you think it it it's it's the more obvious types, or there are horses in here that we're forgetting? Uh, I, I think the, the latter, Jess. I mean, I think Stradivarius definitely didn't have the ideal run around at Ascot, to, to put it mildly. But then at the same time, neither did Kiprios. You know, the race wasn't run to suit him. He had to challenge wide, turning in. It was a lot of jostling. It was a 
pretty unsatisfactory race as we seem to be getting a lot in some of the big races this year. So I, my sort of takeaway is I, I no wiser about Kiprios after the Ascot Gold Cup than I was before it, other than he's just proved that he is yet another tough as teak son of Galileo over staying trips. Um, obviously, Strada's got Andrea Anzini on um, by mutual agreement with Frankie Dottori, very much like my wife and I have agreed mutually that I will do the little shop later this afternoon. Um, but at the prices, I, I, I don't really fancy either. And I think given that we're looking at this from a sort of week in advance, I think the two at the prices are Coltrane around eight to one. Um, an enemy at around 25 to 1. And I would back them both each way now because I think you're going to get three places if you're backing them now about a race that might very well play two places on the day. Um, because I, I don't think Trushan's going to run at all. And I don't know whether uh, Princess So will run either, actually. I think they're probably getting that they've run her on, on quick ground enough now. They'll be looking to something towards the back end of the end of the year in France, maybe the Prix de Cadaran, something like that. Um, so I thought Coltrane is rapidly improving. He'll be able to sit away from the pace. If Andrea and Ryan get into playing jockeys and, and trying to be a bit smart, he can sit well out of the way from that. And they know he'll pick up um, the same with enemy. So those would be my two at the price at the moment. If you ask me who's going to win, uh, Kiprios or Strad, I think Kiprios will finish in front of Strad. But at the price is Coltrane and enemy. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think this race could fall away a little bit. A thunderous subsidy in here, but he was so disappointing last time. I can't see them really rolling it again, even though Charlie Mark Johnson, Dufarm, Goodwood. Enemy is interesting. Obviously, that Quickthorn uh, race has worked out very, very well. Um, and yeah, Coltrane, that run last time at Sandown. And I like the way that Rob Hornby chose to um, change the tactics somewhat. And he was more patiently ridden, came from behind, and he just allowed him to really test out his stamina and it probably was a sort of a learning process for Rob to see how much was left in the tank and there was plenty whereas before at Ascot he was slightly more um, handy with him and beforehand at Chester he was the same so he's clearly horse that they are learning on the job and he's just getting better and better. Melbourne Cup is clearly in their sights, um, big plans of this horse and I think that he's massively exciting um, in a race where I want to take on the the, the leaders, the lead protagonists at, le at least. Um, so definitely big um, support behind Coltrane for Ross and myself in what's been a, a good look at this Good Book Cup. It's going to be a fascinating, fascinating race indeed. The Sussex Stakes we're going to look at next and probably we won't need to spend as much time as this, as the other race, or will we, Luke? No. No. Why he just wins? <laughs> yeah, he should do. I, I, I saw a few comments the other day saying that someone doesn't think we're celebrating Baid enough. Well, I mean, as far as I've well, I've seen, said, and heard, we're sort of saying well, Baid's by far the best that we've seen since Frankel, which I think is a pretty lofty compliment to to Baid. He's just very, very good. Um, he, he was unbelievably exciting in his, his early days. Obviously, he did so much in, sh in, in such a short span. He made his debut at Leicester on the, the 7th of June. You get to the end of the season at um, uh, in October, and he'd already won, what, two group ones, and he was winning at, uh, at Ascot on Champions Day. I, I thought potentially if, if you were going to get him beaten, he might get beaten in the lockings by being a bit too keen, but none of that. He was more impressive than ever, and uh, he, was, he was good last time at, at Royal Ascot. He, he was... He wasn't overly extended, but he was always going to, to win. So he, he will likely just win again uh, here. I, I don't know who's going to take him on. That's a slight issue with, with previewing this race in, in more depth. But one horse I do think will go is Chindit, who I thought might well be in the Lennox, but isn't. Uh, so I would imagine Chindit is just going to go towards the, uh, the Sussex Stakes. He, he'll be a rock solid each way horse. But one thing I say about Chindit, if you want to back him each way, or if you want to back anything each way in this race, do it now because we might be down to five, potentially even four. If you do that now, to, to if, if it's a four runner race, you only have to beat one of them home to um to, to cash the, the, the each way part of your bet. I, I would imagine there'll be there'll be a little bit more than that, but we could easily be looking at seven runners in this or, or six runners. So if you want an each way bet in the race, I, I'd, I'd just about side with Chindit, but I, I would say do it now or, or at least do it before the, the decks come out because you'll be you'll be doing yourself a big favour, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just a bit like um, the, the Goodwood Cup as well. I think 
if anything, in his favour for Baidis this track. He was breathtakingly good uh, when he won last time, this time last year in the in the thoroughbred stakes. And I don't know if necessarily the straight track at Ascot was really in his favour. Uh, Newbury seemed okay as well, but Ascot, I don't, I don't know. It definitely it was it was good without being exceptional. I see. I, I agree with you there, Luke. Um, and he's taking on real world again. Um, it's kind of a way, and I agree with you, Frankel, when you have a horse so good, you, you find it it's difficult to believe that there's another one in the same sphere, perhaps because he wasn't a champion two-year-old. I'd love to see him go abroad and go and do something exceptional further afield than France. Somewhere I'd love him to go over to America for the Breeders' Cup. Why not? Um, but, you know, they, they don't feel that any reason to. to Ross, do you think, how does a jockey look at this race and think, how am I going to try and at least attempt to beat Baid? I think you've just got to ride ride your own race, haven't you? You can't try and beat him. You've got to try and get the maximum out of out of your horse. And I think far too often, jockeys try and beat a horse rather than, than, than get theirs to... To, to run to their to their best form. I mean, I'm a bit cantankerous and I do like to swim against the tide. I don't like people telling me things are good. I don't like the Beatles. I don't like the Arctic Monkeys. I don't like craft beer because everyone tells me I should like it. And <laughs> you're, you're right. You're right about the Arctic Monkeys. And, uh, you're, you're on board there. <laughs> I'm, I'm just a little bit. I mean, it's not I don't like him, but I, I, I'm yet to see what he's what he's really beaten. And okay, he's beaten everything that's there to beat. But the way I looked at it is. Over seven furlongs, surely, given this weight away, you'd fancy Caribus to get pretty close to Baid over seven. This is the quickest mile he's going to have run over Baid. They're talking about stepping him up in trip. So surely they are slightly adjusting the training just to find that bit more relaxation. So I, I thought the disparity in the prices was far too big because I think Caribus, that wasn't... His, They've used Maljum as a line to Caribus. Well, that wasn't the real Caribus last time. He was far too keen for about half of that race last time, and he still got it done. By all accounts, he should have folded up into a into a deck chair in the last furlong, and he didn't. I wonder whether they might run a pacemaker this time, whether modern games might run and just try and go a pace that's going to take the sting out of Caribus in the early stages. OK, we'll head on to the Nassau States uh, for the Phillies. Um, which looks like the complexion of this race, it's hard to really know because usually we get something from um, Aidan O'Brien and Bally Doyle. I think I've read that it could be Concert Hall that's going to end up in this race. Um, I quite like Toy, uh, but it sounds like they're going to go to, to Germany or somewhere like that. In Spiral is not running, uh, but we do have Nashua, um, the Prix de Diane uh, winner for Holly Doyle. Uh, great to see her in this race. I'm looking through it. It's hard to really know who's going to turn up. So do you have a, a big opinion on this? I'll come to Ross first. Well, I mean, we've we've... Obviously, seeing Emily up, John absolutely sluice up in the King George this this weekend. Um, no, we should say we're recording this before the King George. But um, I, I mean, I can see why Nash was a, a short price favourite, and and I think she she is the right price. Uh, it's not a price I want to get anywhere near involved with. Um, so the one a, a big price that I just thought was perhaps a bit of value was Rogue Millennium. Um, she won she won the Oaks Oaks Trial at Lingfield over this trip. She ran a huge race in the Oaks and then absolutely emptied the final furlong, furlong and a half. Um, it was still only four lengths behind Nashua. Now, Nashua ran right through to the line. Rogue Millennium was, was barely in a hat canter at the line. Um, she travelled beautifully through the race. Um, I just thought dropping back to this trip is clearly going suit to her, suit her better. I thought 25 to 1 was an insulting price against Nashua at 4 to 7. What did you make of her run last time in the, in the hoppings? A little bit disappointing? Yeah, it, it, it was. I mean, I think you, you you need to put a line through that if you're believing what I say. But I can come up with two mm -hmm. reasons. You know, one, the Oaks had taken more out of her. Two, she didn't act on the all-weather surface. I mean, I could be wrong on both accounts, of course. And, and truthfully, we'll, we'll, we'll never know until she tries to run the all-weather again and, and does better. But um, uh, as long as I could find two reasons for it, and I could... Um, I, I'm happy to, at that sort of price to, to roll the dice against a, a four to seven shot. 
Yeah, fine. Fair enough. Yeah, she'll always be slightly a bigger price than others. Um, that's Rogue Millennium. Uh, for you, Luke, have you? Is there anything that sort of is might appear that you well you like to see appear? Obviously, as we said, we're we're recording this way before we've even got any sort of real handle on it. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to see in Spiral, but we're not going to yeah. uh, in, in this. Um, this is the race of the five that we're previewing that I found hardest, just because I don't really know what's going to run. I like Le Petit Coco, but I don't really see her winning at a Nassau. My Astra was obviously behind her last time around. That kind of rules out the potential next two in the, the market. I think Nashua should just win this. She, she was very, very good uh, over in France last time around. Obviously, had to work a little harder to get to the um, the, the lead in the first sort of furlong or so, but Holly Doyle gave her a lovely ride. She was she was very good before that at, at Epsom uh, when not being beaten all that uh, that far. But I agree with Ross. If Rogue Millennium were to turn up here, then she'd probably be the each way play in the, in the race for me. She's 25, 33 to one around that sort of, of price tag. She's impressed me thus far in what she's done and she's not done a great deal. She, she's only had limited amount of chances to actually get to the race course. The yard have been going very well this uh, this season. I, I could just see, I, I, I maybe couldn't see her winning the race, but I could absolutely see her being in the um, the three. But like I say, of the five, it was the race that I found hardest just because we, we do not know who's going to turn up in this. At least with the, the Lennox and the Sussex, you can kind of work out who's got cross entries. The Goodwood Cup, you've kind of heard a little bit more about, but the Nassau, a little bit later on in the uh, the week, we, we've not heard as much as of yet, but... We know that Nashua should at least um, at least be there, and I, I would imagine that Rogue Millennium will be turning up as well. Yeah, this is a race where it's not really a betting proposition, and if there's anything of a double figure price, I'd be interested in because I think Nashua is the likely winner. Dream Loaf is probably the only one I can forgive her for her run at, at the Curra. I don't, you know, she she just it's according to her jockey just never travelled, um, and she just it wasn't the real her, and that can happen to fillies. They just don't touch show up for whatever reason and then come back again. Um, so I like to forgive her for that because her, her runs, the two runs before that have been brilliant. Very and also so versatile, doesn't mind the ground. She was very good at long shot, where she was ridden, given a beautiful ride by Kieran Schumark, who obviously was very good at this track last year when he won on Lady Boat Bothorpe. And I don't know, she just she just could be one that might be overlooked again based on that run. So she could be there or thereabouts. But yeah, the, this race, um, the Nassau, is probably quite difficult for us to to really get our handle on, as could be the King George Qatar Stakes for the sprinters. But this is a race that I love, and it's also more open now um, that we don't have the Tash, um, a little bit more fun. And I just think, personally, that these sprinters this season have been excellent. Um, we've seen some fabulous performances, and I think there are horses to take out of plenty of races that are all going to feel they're all going to we're going to see run in this race, and then it's just a bit more quality about it than the recent years. What do you think, Ross? Yeah, I, I agree. I think there's, uh, you know, the old adage you could run this ten times and get ten different results. You yeah. know, they're, they're, they're they're running to a decent level, um, but it relies on luck in running and just being cherry ripe on the day you know there's been one outstanding performance uh, of the year and, and that's by nature strip and he's safely tucked up in his box back in Aus australia um i can see why twilight calls is favorite what i couldn't understand is that why he's the price he is and then at, at 10 to 1 is Aklam express who was just a neck behind him um in the uh king stand albeit they were half a furlong behind nature strip but he's not here so that doesn't matter so i thought straight away at Clem express at, at, at 10 to 1 was interesting and then using the same sort of theory really um clarendon house is 25 to 1 he finished just a neck behind ras at, at, at goodwood um earlier in the season now he was giving him five pound there is of course every chance that ras has just come on a bundle as he appears to be doing with each run but i think clarendon house had excuses the last couple of times uh, if he settles getting down to the start, watch him in the prelims. You know, if he doesn't boil over, I think he's he's much better than a 25 to 1 shot. Um, so those would be my two uh, in a race where I think it is wide open. Yeah, I think because of that, horses just not getting any luck in running, not running the races, they can be overpriced a little bit um, and, and, and come out and have their day in the sunshine. Uh, they're just to go through it just quickly, um, as... Ross was saying Twilight Calls is a pretty short price. Royal Acclaim, whether she runs or not, she's in here. Rassel, who's been, I know the horse watchers have been saying this, this has been the race that they've been thinking of ever since um, 
I think where he was was beaten at York earlier on in the season. Flotis, the Phillies in here. Swayze, who won here last year, maybe she'll be back. Kadem, Bahi, as as Ross was saying, Akram Express. Just horses that we've seen show up against each other time and time again. Um, Luke, how did you look at this race at this stage? I'm I'm a bit more Ross Miller on this. In was it cantankerous? Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. (laughs) We've called him plenty of things on this podcast. Um, I, I think it's all, it's good. It's good. But I, I was also, before the, the King stands, thinking, thank goodness Nature Strip and Golden Palette here. Otherwise, this would be a pretty moderate, well, it would be a very moderate group one. Group two company here, so a little bit more leeway. But Twilight Calls is a horse I like. If he's favourite for this, I'd be a bit disappointed that there's nothing better around. But Royal Acclaim, I would imagine if she turns up, she'll probably head the market. Um, I don't know if she is going to run. I was covering the, the meeting that she won at at Bath a couple of starts ago, and it was just a run-of-the-mill Bath meeting. And then suddenly you've got Royal Acclaim winning by, what, three and a quarter lengths, hard on the bridle after getting into the world of trouble, thinking, goodness me, who on earth are you? And all form is stacking up. The, the debut form was very, very nice. It beat a, a couple of very good two-year-olds. Managed to um, to win... I thought very nicely, obviously, at Bath. Frisky was back in second, who has gone on to to win uh, subsequently. That race last time around at York, I thought, was was very nice as well. Granted, I don't think beat massive amounts, I must say that, but it's the way that she's been beating her rivals. And I do think Royal Acclaim, if she turns up, she'd be the one to to, to beat. But betting-wise, Mitt Bahe, I think, is really overlooked in the the market. I'm a little surprised they didn't go to Royal Ascot because... The, the week before, Mitt Bahi um, managed to win at uh, Sandown and would have picked up a penalty, would have gone to the Palace of Holy Rood House. She's now rated 107, but she would have what picked up the £5 penalty from that. She was rated 99, I think it was around the time or so, but something like, yeah, it was 97, sorry, she was rated. But that was a very, very good effort. Obviously, it was beaten there last time around behind uh, Rarsel. I just think this... Real strong gallop, obviously going downhill at Goodwood over the five. That's going to suit Mitt Bahi absolutely down to the ground. And I think I called he or she earlier on, but I think it will suit him 100%. But at the prices, I'd rather take Mitt Bahi. But like I say, I'm, I'm a I'm a little bit more Ross Miller on this. Do you think that Mitt Bahi was just slightly um, unlucky at Sandown last time where he'd beaten by Rossell? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, Sandown's one of those tracks, isn't it? The, the sprint course is a nightmare for uh, for quite a few. You meet a little bit of trouble, suddenly you're on the back foot. But if if the Mitt Bar he turns up from from two outings ago, then I'm very, very interested in, in him. Like I say, they always go a really, really strong gallop in this. I know in recent years we've been spoiled with, with like you say, Batash. Uh, he's gone crazy fast in this and just and just kept that up. We're generally look, looking to stop the clock sort of 50 four maybe even 53 and a half seconds in in this sort of race i think that's around the time we're looking at it's one of the fastest uh, five furlong races in the in the whole world never mind that the country but i think it could just suit mit bahi okay right so mit bahi in the in the king george um the king george catastics um for luke um i i just have so much an admiration for Russell. i think he's uh, just a the kind of sprinter that you could go to war with he is has turned up at every dance this season and has put in three wins. He loves Goodwood. He's gone through that classic sort of handicap into listed into group company. I don't think Sam was necessarily his track last time, yet he was still one a bit. He probably was just drawn right in the end. Um, I think that he's just he he could still be on that right upward trajectory. And uh, yeah, he's just a horse that's just been campaigned really well and maybe not going to ask it, like, like not going to, to it with Mitt Bar. He has just helped him. Um, whereas, you know, that can take out a lot from, from these sprinters. Um, but for ourselves, for me, who I believe has just been, tar- they've targeted this race for some way out. The other one is slightly tentative, but I do love her and I really respect her. I think she's improved this season as Flotus for Simon Ed Crisford, who's been a winner here at Goodwood before. Now, the only thing, reason why I'm tentative is because the July Cup taught 
was a big lesson for me to see how well the three-year-olds would do against the four-year-old, against the old, their elders. And they really didn't show up. Whatever excuse they had for perfect power, he wasn't good enough in the day. on the day. Maybe they're just not as quite as good or as robust enough or ready enough to take on their elders, whatever it would be. But Flotus, she gets a good level of weight. And I was really taken by, her, by the performance she put up. Yes, it was only against Phillies last time at York, but they were her elders. So she was able to do that. So she's got a diff- harder task on her hands against um, the Colts and the Geldings. Um, but I think that she's one that has just has still got more improvement to come. So Floaters for me, she's around about seven to one and Rossell's not far behind, um, probably about six to one or so. So that's a good look at the King George Stakes. We've got flown through the key races from every day. But as Luke was mentioning earlier, we've got things like the Stewards Cup. We've got things like the Mile. It's so much racing um, in and around Goodwood for the five days. So we'll give this opportunity, if anyone does, to have a nap of the week. Um, so, Ross, is there anything that's caught your eye? Uh, n- not huge. I think free wins going to be very hard to beat in the Lily Langtry. I mean, it probably won't be much of a prize, so it's not really... Uh... Not really a pearl of wisdom, but I, I, I thought if you asked me to, to, to pick a winner of, of the week, uh, free wind in the Lady Langtree would be it. Okay, so don't forget free wind from Ross. And Luke, did anything catch your eye? Um, it's, it's a silly race to bet anti-post in, but the Golden Mile, you, you could lose your bet before the race if you're drawn sort of 10 or higher. But I love Montasib. I, I wasn't with him last time around in, in that I didn't really think he, he'd act on the track, but I thought he ran a really good race when still probably a bit inexperienced at, um, at Ascot, uh, the Royal meeting. But before that, he was very, very impressive here at, um, at Goodwood. I, I think there's a lot more to come from Montasib. We, we probably are looking at a group horse, albeit he's just stuttered a little bit in his last two runs on his progression towards group company. Like I say, I hope the draw is, is going to help him out, but... At the moment, he's 10 to 1, 12 to 1. I'll, I'll take the risk because he won't be that on the day. Okay, okay, brilliant. So there's nothing in there from the Stewards' Cup. I thought that's where you were going to lean to. Uh, I, I, I like Popmaster in the Stewards' Cup. Yeah. But uh, I, I've given myself the tough task of the Golden Mile. I'm I'm silly. I'm not crazy to try and take on both <laughs> of those. But, um, Popmaster, potentially. I'd like to see Nahar turn up in that, but um, I'll... I'll spend a few more hours this week looking through the Stewards' Cup. Yeah, definitely, absolutely. No, very tough races at Goodwood, huge fields, and um, as I said, we're recording this um, far, far from um, declaration stage for most of them anyway. Um, for myself, I'm going to put up one of our horses, Wooderton, who will either run whether he gets in or not to the three-year-old plus seven furlong race, which is on the Wednesday, and there's the three-year-old only race on the Saturday. Both so both over seven furlongs. Now that we've managed to get him to settle, um, he's really showing us what he can do and what he's made of. Um, he's a horse that's gone up nine pounds in the handicap after his last win at Chester, um, but he's in really good form. And I think there's still probably a little bit of juice there in his handicap mark. But um, I think if anything, I'd like to see him in the three or plus race so he can get a little bit of weight from his elders. Um, and he's been in really good form. So that's one from us. I um, always get a bit nervous mentioning them, but I thought I may as well. Um, we have flown through Goodwood. There's plenty more action um, in and around um, the week. And I'm sure that we'll, there'll be opportunities from Ross and from Luke and from the rest of the SBK family to give away selections, possibly on social media, but always on our YouTube channel where there's plenty of content. Um, George Bowie, who has ticked off every single festival um, this season, I think. Um, he's had a winner wherever you want. I'm sure we'll be aiming a lot of his horses high for this week as well. So you'll find a lot of his content on our YouTube channels. Um, and don't forget, as always, Luke, you'll be back for your Saturday edition, I'd imagine, for a bit of America stuff. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if we're doing it while Tom's on, on maternity leave, but we, we okay. will be back at at some point. Um if Tom's not around next week, then you get the delights of me once again. So I apologize for that. Uh, but um, I, I will I'll potentially all. see you next week. If not, then then come say hi on the SBK Saturday Night Selections. 
Brilliant, yeah. Well, I'm sure that um, Tom is uh, doing a lot of his studying anyway. <laughs> he doesn't ta- it doesn't take a lot from him to, to take away from the American stuff. We will be back um, after Goodwood uh, for more previews. We hope that we found a few winners for you there. Make sure to like, subscribe and join us again. Thanks to Ross and thank you very much to Luke and we will see you soon.